Hi, welcome to Yeti Zen Speaks event on analytics. I'm Sanat Chaudhry, the CEO of Yeti Zen. Uh, this is one of the events we are partnering with Inmobi to bring to you here online. So, everyone knows about analytics. You hear about it, all the major conferences at GDC all the time. The fact that we do need analytics is very well ex accepted. But what should we measure? When should we measure it? What, how does that drive business growth? Those are things people still have a lot of disagreement, if not debate on. Our talk today is focused on that. So please watch the rest of this talk. We have some great presentations and a panel for you. And I look forward to seeing you at the next one. So thank you so much for coming out to our Yeti Zen Speaks event. How many of you have been to a Yeti Zen event before? Raise your hands. Awesome. Well, so you already know what we do. But for those of you that are new, Yeti Zen has two arms. Yeti Zen Speaks, which is monthly events like this one, big parties around the conferences, and all around the idea of education and networking for game developers. And then we also run a games accelerator. So some of you know our portfolio companies. We had an announcement last night from Grantune, now called Fuel, that just raised 3.5 million. So that's a recent win for us. We're very happy about that. Um, and uh, we've been running accelerator now also for about two, two and a half years. Uh, and soon, some great announcements coming on that end as well. So um, you all came out to learn more about analytics. Who thinks analytics? are important. Raise your hand. Everyone. Okay, so at this point everyone thinks they're important, but there's very little agreement on what all one should be measuring, and also when in the life cycle, and what are the best practices around that. So that's what our event is about today. And so we're going to get started with Mehik Sharma from InMobi, who's going to give us an overview around all the top 10 metrics for analytics that game developers should swear by. Right, Mehik? I think so, yeah. She okay. thinks so. Okay. Uh, she, this woman's been traveling a lot, pulling some all-nighters. She pulled an all-nighter for this presentation, so no, let's give her all your attention. <laughs> okay, let's give her a hand. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful event, right? I was just talking to someone and I was telling them that um, this room is so, the view is so beautiful that at any point, if you get bored, you can just look outside. You know? It's so nice. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> you want to, it was Jeff, right? <laughs> so, um, as Sana mentioned, I think the topic of today's talk was just mobile analytics. And it's a pretty controversial topic, especially for game developers. They think that, in general, analytics is not important if you have a good game design, which is right, right? You have a good game design, you can only do incremental uh, improvements in your game design with analytics, but that will really help you get ahead of the competition, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly talk about the broad buckets of mon uh, broad buckets of analytics, what are the metrics that you need to measure, and how can you influence them. So we're just going to focus on that, and I'll get started. So a little bit about myself. I lead the business development team at Mobi. I handle two verticals, gaming and commerce. Um, before this, I was actually working in the product and operations team at Mobi, and uh, you know handling LTV feedback loop and our performance just optimization algorithm. And uh, prior to that, prior to Mobi, I was working in a very different field, renewable energy. I was actually with a venture capital fund working on renewable energy investments. And before that, I was at Intel. Um, so as Sana said, uh, the topic is top 10 metrics that developers could swear by. So here's my thought. I, I personally don't think there is any 10 metrics that you can really swear by, right? There's no, there's no silver bullet here. Each game has its own context. Each company has its own context. So uh, depending on the life cycle of your game, if you're early on, you're looking at behavioral metrics, you're looking at metrics that can affect your product. If you're at a global launch point, you're looking at marketing metrics. Uh, if your company has a large risk appetite, then you're looking at you know, how to handle that. And then if, you know, the level of accuracy that you're looking at, the level of investment that you're looking to put in your analytics team is according to that. So it could really differ based on your own context. Um, the second thing is I think metrics are pretty well known to everyone, right? Everyone knows you got to measure C CTR, CVR, um, ARPU, uh, daily active users, etc. Because analytics is really a commodity right now when, when it comes to measuring products. It's really everything is available. You can just go out and have 10 people come to you with their own solutions. Um, in fact, the problem that a lot of developers that we speak to, they face the issue of analysis paralysis, right? There's a lot of data out there. 
what do we do with it? How do we make sense of that data? And I think uh, the two most important things that come into play there are just prioritizing the set of metrics that you should look at and segmenting that data, right? So, uh, you know, do you use geo level segments? Do you use behavioral level segments? So that's probably the most important thing that you need to look at. And uh, that's probably the last point that's very important is that the analytics team in every company plays a role of kind of joining the product team and the marketing team. So, uh, you know, you really, as an analytics team, you have to figure out a process that is iterative and create that feedback loop where you can take market signals, you can tweak them, give that feedback to the product team and just release something as fast as possible. So it has to be fast and accurate. Um, so I think the, the key metrics that, you know, the, the key buckets in which all the metrics fall are here. The first is retention, right? Retention is probably the most important metric for every developer. Retention uh, kind of indicates how much your users are enjoying the game, are they having fun while playing your game or not. It also helps you uh, figure out the lifetime value of a game. So if you don't have retention, then there's very little hope for you to even improve on it because users are coming back, you can at least do something with them. But if you don't have retention, then there's really, uh, it's really difficult for you to even optimize based on the user behavior. Um, the second is um, engagement, which is relatively uh, easy to measure. It's just it's a lot of metrics, so you have to figure out which is uh, relevant for you. Third is monetization, which is essentially how much revenue is your game making, pretty simple. Um, fourth is virality, which is tough to measure, but yet very important, especially with the cost, the CPI is soaring in the market. Virality has become a very powerful tool for you know, spreading the word for your app. And then the last is acquisition. And a lot of these metrics are very well documented. We'll start with acquisition because that's where you actually start getting users. We'll just delve a little deeper into what the tracking solutions out there, how do you make a decision about which tool to work with, and then what are the metrics that you look at. Meg, is it okay to interrupt with questions? Oh yeah, feel free to just raise your hand and interrupt as much as possible. So uh, I have about 15 to 20 minutes, so we'll try to make it really quick. Um, there are lots of slides, but we can always you know, take questions and you know, whatever's on our permits, so. I have all the power. <laughs> All right, this is the easy part, right? Everyone knows you have to measure campaigns when you do user acquisition. You need to measure where users are coming from, which is the most valuable segment, right? Uh, you have to make sure your spends are ROI positive and you optimize based on that. Um, however, the problem in the ecosystem right now is just the entire tracking um, ecosystem is it's evolving very fast, right? There are changes overnight. For example, the whole MVT Facebook fallout, uh, the, just the IDs changing every day. Google recently said they only want to measure uh, matches based on Google Refer, Google AID. So uh, whatever solution you integrate with today might just be obsolete tomorrow. So you have to be making decisions based on you know, whatever, you know, whatever solutions are out there, look at the trends that are there, and then based on that you make your decisions. Um, the second is the marketplace is really, really fragmented. And I don't need the solutions out there. I actually need just mobile in general. Um, you know, there are too many handsets based on whatever your priority is on where you're marketing your app, which geos are important for you. Japan doesn't allow device ID based tracking. There, it allows it, but there are some issues around it. China has some fraud issues. So you need to take all these into consideration and your marketing priorities when you make decisions about your uh, tracking solution. Uh, the third is uh, there's this trade-off between accuracy and scale, right? You can either go with the most accurate solution that's out there, or you can get the most scale that's there with tracking solutions because it's tracking is based on device ID and fingerprinting. We'll talk about it in a little bit, but these are the two based uh, solutions. Device ID is accurate, but fingerprinting gives you the scale. So you have to always have that trade-off that's there. And the fourth is all the privacy concern, right? Do I share my data with anyone? What are they going to do with my data? You know, lots of these um, tracking partners that are out there have, you know, there, there are issues with that. They're not all independent. So you need to figure out how that partner is going to use your data, right? Um, so there are three broad technologies, uh, pretty well known device ID, fingerprinting, and browser cookies that everyone uses to track right now. Um, I'll quickly go through this and we can stop for any questions. 
Uh, device ID is the most accurate form of tracking. Uh, right now, it's pretty standardized both across iOS and Android. iOS is all IDFA-based tracking. Android is Android Refer and Google AID, which is going to be uh, the trend going forward. It, the good thing is it's you know it's actually the most accurate form of tracking that you could have. But the problem is that. Uh, there's only tier one and few tier two countries that actually have good coverage in IDFAs, right? So if you want to have a campaign that's global, you want to have as many users as possible, then it's really difficult for you to run a campaign that's purely matched with device size because you're not going to get the scale. Um, also on the ad partner side, it requires upstream integration with all the publishers and traffic sources. So uh, you know you need to make sure the partner that you're working with has a decent coverage of device IDs. Um, cookies is, uh, it's not very much in use anymore. There are very few partners that use it. The good thing about cookie, which is not available in device IDs, is you can actually track web traffic as well. So uh, it, it's not very accurate. The user experience is not good, but it lets you track on web. So it's not very, uh, it's not very prominent right now, but it, it used to be there in, in the market still. Um, so the fingerprinting solution, which is there with a lot of tracking partners right now, is uh, very interesting. It's basically a probabilistic method. It's based on triangulation of a few device parameters, like IP address and a few other things, to figure out if the device ID is correct when you're making a download. Um, the good thing with it, it's more accurate than cookies, but it still has that probabilistic method, right? So you, if you have a game that's very viral, there is a possibility that you're probably overpaying to your ad network because fingerprinting is just over attributing your downloads to that ad network. So um, you need to be a little careful. You need to have some way of flexibly just configuring your like, fingerprinting logic at the back end so that you can change the accuracy of it based on your app virality. Um, this is a question I get asked a lot, right? How do I make a decision about which tracking solution to go with? There are lots of tracking solutions out there. Uh, everyone looks the same on the outside. The pricing, everyone's just trying to compete with each other. They'll give you an attractive pricing. So um, here are a few things that we recommend to a lot of the uh, you know, clients that we work with. So the first thing is, which is uh, now available with a few uh, tracking partners, is configurable attribution, right? We just talked about how fingerprinting, um, whether it's conservative or it's really generous, can really affect uh, the number of downloads that are attributed to a particular partner. So I think it's really important to make sure that you can change the logic of matching at the back end with the partner that you work with, right? So whether it's the way your device ID permutation and combinations are happening, or if it's the fingerprinting logic, if you just want to match an IP address or you want to use more parameters, because that can really affect your pricing when you're buying. So if you tweak it at the back end and if you make it really conservative and you don't see any changes in your rankings or your downloads, that means you're probably overpaying, right? So you need to always keep it on the conservative side. However, if it affects your pricing, then you go back and you raise it up a little bit and then you should see better results. Um, the second is reporting. So this is fairly standardized. A lot of solutions out there give a very good reporting dashboard. You get all the data that you can see. But one of the latest trends that has started is uh, being able to send cost data back to track part tracking partners which is great. So, so far, a lot of tracking partners don't give you any cost data. So essentially what you do is you have a reporting API, you get all the clicks and the installs, and then you have costs in-house, you stitch it, and then you make your own dashboard. But if the tracking partner can actually send you all, all the cost data as well, then you can measure the cost and the ROI per channel, per cohort, per geo, on the tracking partner's dashboard as well. So you should try and work with a partner that can let's, let, lets you send that, that has the ability to integrate with the ad network to send the cost data back as well. Um, and then obviously uh, with RTB coming up, it has the ability to break down that data with the publisher or any segment that you'd like. Um, service obviously is very important. Uh, with pricing, a lot of people tend to make decisions. I, I always recommend talking to as many developers as possible, get feedback, go on Quora, just write questions about a specific partner that you want to work with. There's a lot of feedback out there about each tracking partner. 
we've been with a lot of clients where they're spending lots of money, it's a weekend, they never get responses from ad uh, partners, and it's pretty scary, right? Because you don't know where your downloads are coming from, you don't know what the cost is, so you have to be careful um, you know, of the service that they offer. And then pricing, which I think usually all the people go with. It's good to go with a cheap tracking solution, but all these points are very important. You don't want to be integrating multiple SDKs every six months in your app because it just takes too much time, too much investment, it's not worth it. All right, so um, on the metric side, so what are the most important metrics on the user acquisition side that you need to track? Pretty simple, CPI and LTV, right? There's uh, no one answer about what should be the CPI, what should be the LTV. It depends on your game, it depends on your appetite, it depends on the investment level that you're putting into the game. Um, as a thumb rule, I get asked this question a lot because a lot of you I've talked to are trying to still develop a game. Um, if you're doing a soft launch, a lot of developers ask us, you know, so should we be paying three or four or one, or should it be more than a global launch or less than it? And I think. I think uh, personally soft launch is really, really important because that's the time you can really tweak your product, change a lot of things. So uh, if you're trying to get traffic in some of the tier one competitive countries like Australia, which is the most popular one, or uh, Canada, then you need to pay slightly more uh, for your you know, launch as compared to your global launch. So uh, we always recommend going with Nordics um, and Canada as opposed to Australia because it's really expensive. You still get a lot of engaged users. You get a pretty good data about how the users interacting with the game and you can make tweaks into the game based on that. Um, also during the soft launch, you definitely want to segment your users based on behavioral triggers as opposed to just geo or platform level triggers, right? You want to figure out where is your new user dropping off. You want to have like an onboarding funnel. So that's very important. Um, a lot of people still look at it from a device perspective, but that doesn't really give you any actionable insights because you have to go back to your product team and be like, hey, in the global launch, I need these things to be changed. So you have to look at behavioral triggers at the time of your soft launch for sure. Uh, for the final launch, uh, CPI is really based on your game. Um, there are ballpark values here, but it really depends on the game. It depends on what you're, what's, what's the kind of scale you're looking at, where you're launching, etc. Um, LTV calculations, right? Um, I think also what would you share with your ad networks, right? So when you're trying to optimize for CPI and LTV, uh, you can either keep the LTV data to yourself and then pass that data back to the ad network, or you could um, actually, well, sorry, you could either keep it to yourself or pass it to the ad network, right? Some people uh, don't want to share any LTV data with the ad network, but right now I've seen it's really the trend is to have as much downstream transparency as possible. You want to share uh, some sort of revenue pains or tutorial completion pains or level uh, completion pains with your partners so that you can, you know, they can actually optimize to that uh, target. So uh, it really depends on what your priorities are, but uh, this is the most efficient method. If you're not comfortable sharing revenue data, you could share some mass data about events or, you know, A, B, C, D, and just share that data and let them optimize based on the segment or the publisher. It really depends on you. And uh, this is a very new method. A lot of people are doing it is that they just mask all the data. And, by that the partner doesn't know what does each alphabet stand for, but still they let you know they can actually get the data and optimize for that um, event as well. All right, um, so LTV, it's not rocket science. Uh, we I've actually used a reference of Eric Super Premium Economics. If you're really uh, trying to figure out your LTV engagement I think this is a great source and it is very academic in nature but it's you know it's established with a pretty good baseline which you can tweak based on your own uh, consideration so he defines um, LTV based on just monetization and the lifetime of your app lifetime is calculated uh, based on your retention curve so all the data that you get for LTV is in the early days of your app obviously because it's you just have one or two or three percent of users who are actually interacting and playing the game, so it's a very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to even predict LTV and engagement uh, in the initial days. 
but he just standardizes based on a decay curve. So assuming that if you're looking at day one, seven, 14, 20, 30, then you just assume that it's 50% drop at every point. And then you take the area on the curve and then you multiply it with the total uh, training, um, trailing ARP2, which essentially is uh, you know, the revenue that, they, that you get, make per user, per, per active user per day. And uh, it's a trailing ARP2 because you, you don't want to take into consideration any of the extremes and data points. You just want to level it out for, let's say, 14 days or 28 days and then calculate it. Um, we're going to have some handouts, but you know, we usually share this with a lot of developers who are trying to figure out which market to launch in, which, you know, which are high LTV, which are high scale. This is based on a lot of developers that we work with, but this is pretty precious because when you're trying to figure out, hey, based on my category, which country should I launch in, what's the amount of scale that I'm going to get. So this is an index, this is all index data. But uh, some of the countries that are coming up, obviously a lot of Android markets that are popular right now are US, uh, UK, Korea, Japan, um, India, Indonesia, and Thailand. A lot of gaming companies are trying to go aggressive there. And uh, for a lot of social apps, we've seen a lot of tier three countries doing extremely well. So if you have a non-gaming app, tier three countries are really, really performing well for gaming apps. It's pretty much global, but you can use this as a benchmark. So it's going to be on Yedison's website or on Moby's website. You can just go ahead and look at it and um, just use this data. It's tweeted it too. Tweeted it? Great. <laughs> Any, uh, uh, so just time check, four minutes left? Four minutes? Oh my God. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to skip this part. <laughs> um, all right, I think, yeah, I'm just going to skip to the most interesting part. Well, this is virality. It's, it's easy. You all know what's virality. Premium economics covers it really well. So let's go to the last part where we talk about how to decide between ad versus um, in-app purchases, right? I think that's the big question that a lot of people have. And uh, we, we at Mobi we work with a lot of developers, um, and in general, whenever I interact with people, I think there are lots of philosophies around it. If there's no one answer, it really depends on your genre, on the category of the app that you're working with. But this is a pretty good uh, you know, two by two matrix that we use to we just help work with developers. Right, and we, we don't have time, but I could have gotten into some case studies, which I will share later on the website. But uh, you know, one good way is, you know, a lot of developers that I speak to really just look at engagement or monetization. And they only try to just improve engagement or just improve monetization, which uh, is it's a good approach, but I think this is a better one, right? You need to look at both of them concurrently. You need to be able to look at all your users and say, okay, this is the set of users that's not engaged or monetized. This is the set of users that's not engaged, uh, that's engaged but monetized, well, that's incorrect. But it's basically engagement and monetization. And you want to move all your users in that quadrant. You want to move all your users to the upper right quadrant, right? So um, every action that you take has to be based on that. So what we recommend is that if, uh, you know, let's say if your user is really engaged but it's not monetized, there's no point sending him to another game within your portfolio. There's no point. Uh, you know, giving him rewards. There's no point giving him notifications because even if he comes back, he's probably not going to spend anything on your game. So the best way to make use of such a customer is to show him an ad, right? You, you get some money, you'll go to some other game, probably spend some money there, right? But, but I want to point out that even if a user is not actively spending money in the game, in order to have an active community that is fun for the people who will pay to play your game, it is very important to have community members who are either helping new members, who are writing stories, who are engaging and contributing to your game in other ways, they are still valuable even if they are not monetizable. Not, not, not Absolutely. And I'm not saying that uh, if you have a lot of engagement, and I think there could be varying degrees of it. Obviously, there's no black and white answer to it. But if there is a way for you to determine that a particular user is valuable to you because of certain reason, then you could take that approach and continue you know, engaging the user. But at some point, if you decide that, well, we've done all of it, we've, we've gotten whatever we wanted out of the user, then you could probably then just show him ads. You know? Because then with the ads that you have right now, as opposed to what it was six months back, you still make revenue. Everyone's trying to maximize revenue. It really depends on you know your personal priorities. So, but I agree. I agree. You can't just let an engaged user who's probably you know he could be driving a lot of viral viral users for you, organic users, but you don't know. It's tough to really measure it at this point. But uh, 
you know, if there is a point where you can measure it, it would be really easy, right? Um, so if there's a user that's not, it's monetizing, but it's not engaged, you just want to send him to another game of yours based on his, you know, session length, based on his frequency of signing, it really depends on that. Um, and then there's uh, obviously a user that's not engaged or not monetized, you want to get him back to the game. You always want to fix engagement issues first and then get to monetization. So if engagement is not fixed, you can't even do anything with it because you just don't have good, any good retention. So that's a that's one framework that we follow with a lot of developers that we work with. It's a, it's a good one to, uh, it's pretty handy. Uh, for ads, I think uh, one of our previous talks we talked about ads, but when a user is engaged and is not monetizing, um, you know, and you want to try and figure out which ad to show at what point, one of the things that we're trying to really uh, propagate at this point is to to try and think of ads same as you think of in-app monetization. Right? There are lots of ad formats that are out there. Everyone is a different uh, you know level of engagement for the user. So if the user is happy, you could show them a brand ad. That you know Coke wants to show an ad to all the users that are happy and just one level, right? Uh, if a user has a long wait time and he's you know just wait, he's been engaged. He's you've seen that he's playing the game, but he has a long pause in the game. You can show him a playable ad that would just engage him even more. If uh, you know the, the user just lost. Uh, the level, then you can show him a rewarded ad, which will let him come back and then play the game again. And then, uh, if there's if there's a natural pause in the game, you want to show him an interstitial ad. So we're trying to work with a lot of developers where we, you know, study their game, look at their user metrics, and try to think of ads in the same way as you think of in-app purchases. And that's really helped us improve the, you know, monetization and the revenue for a lot of developers by three to four times. So these are the two two frameworks that we've been using a lot for just deciding between ads and no ads, um, ads and monetization by in-app purchases, um, and that's working out really well. So I skipped all the slides, but if I have more time, I can go back to case something. So, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. What is the most interesting you think you found out about native? Um, in terms of the user experience, there's so many interesting things. I think um, what we've seen is when we talk to developers, a lot of times they never even think of inserting an ad at some point. But uh, with native, you really have that flexibility. You could just insert an ad based on the user behavior and not think of it as like an ad you know, format that just you know just shows up in the middle of nothing, right? So just the flexibility of native has allowed us to open a lot of inventory out in the market. So a lot of people are thinking of ads to be inserted in their regular user experience as a part of the content. So that's, I think, the most interesting thing. Ads are being thought as content as opposed to being something that's just annoying for the users, you know? Anything else? There's lots of gray info there. Yes. Also, a slide talking about localization <laughs> that this gives. Uh, yeah, so I'm just wondering if that's a uh, localized versus non localized uh, app or game. Does it monetize better? Is Absolutely. It, is, it, is it best life that's talking about that? Uh, we were talking about how to influence your CTR metrics there. Oh, right. uh, yeah, so there was a talk about how can you localize and improve your CTRs and in, 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 in some geos, etc. So, anything else? There's a lot of information in there. Final well, call for questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, awesome. Meg. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Heads up, while the whole is rather close. Uh, my name is Jacob Thilman. I'm one of the co-founders of Yeti Zen. Uh, we are an accelerator and a community of game developers. Uh, but I'd like each of you to go down and just give a brief introduction of where you're at and your background. My name is Danny. Get closer. Yeah, they're, they're not very sensitive. My name is Danny Zaniga. I'm from Machine Zone. I'm the lead analyst there. My background is in analytics. I actually was part of the accelerator here with Jacob a few years back. Uh, my name is Terry Yee. I'm a lead product manager at Stormate. Before that, I was at Zynga. And before that, I was at the Sloan School of Business. Cool. So Fabian, uh, I'm currently at Apani, and I used to be at DNA in Perfect World, and uh, spent like 10 years in gaming industry before going to the dark side of analytics. <laughs> 
So I wanted tonight to go a little bit deeper than typical discussions on analytics. I feel like we go to a lot of conferences and people say, use analytics, use analytics, but what specifically are we looking to measure? And in a very detailed level, how can we increase the metrics that we're monitoring? Um, so diving in, we're gonna start with user acquisition and distribution. Uh, obviously, it is incredibly powerful to track incoming sources from different users. Uh, it seems that post install events are uh, really the premier and preferred method for gauging the value of these distribution sources. Uh, how are you currently tracking these sources, the incoming traffic? Well, I could start. Um, so I've been using successfully, I think, uh, We've been trying, so DNA was with Scott Shava. I think uh, initially we're doing it like manually, <laughs> which was interesting. It was before the age of tracking. Uh, and then I've been lucky enough to use MATS offer, which was a really good solution. But sadly, as you know, uh, the big fallout with Facebook make it so that a lot of developers have to move away. And looking at the market, I think uh, you know, you've mentioned some of the great offering out there. Uh, so far, our choice is really- she didn't really mention anything. Yes, yeah, she, she, exactly. Uh, I think you know, Addix is is really broadest solid solution that are really focused on their offering, uh, and it's um, you know if you have to market a few apps only, uh, the pricing is very interesting. Now on the other end, I will say just that even is is very interesting value proposition as well as the apps flyer. Um, my personal choice in the last two jobs, or rather my team's uh, choices, have been Addix, and we've been pretty happy with it. I think they've really improved a lot in the support lately. You know, the world merger, the ad with Criteo, um, and the fact that you know the landscape has changed uh, makes it difficult for a lot of those uh, newcomers. But I think uh, a lot of them have scaled up recently and, and step up their game. So we use a variety of. Um, ad tracking sources and that's just because we really believe that more data points is better. We do a lot of auditing and work with data, so um, yeah, we use a bunch. Yes, same, we use a lot, we also, yeah. Okay, uh, what post-install events are valuable to track and how are you segmenting those audience streams? Okay. So for, for us, you know, we have uh, uh, custom build tracking for the post uh, install events in general. So, you know, we have uh, everything that the player has done on the device. So, the most important things that we like to think of uh, at Stormy is, is really the funnel. So, we start all the way back from discovering the store, from our packaging, uh, tapping on the app store discovery search, all the way through to the how long does it take to load the load screen to go, uh, do players get to the first step of the tutorial, and then at what point in the tutorial do they drop off, and then the standard D1730 uh, retention. But really, we, we really care about that first time user experience, uh, especially for brand new to network individuals. Uh, you know, because it's, it's an introduction for a brand, it's an introduction to our network and our suite of games. So it's really important for us that, you know, we show the players you know, exactly um, what we have to offer. Yeah, for so us, um, we track all the tutorial specs, just like they said. Um, so, but one of the big things I think that's extremely important is just defining what you, what you think an engaged user is. And for different games, it's gonna be different things. Sometimes just getting out of the tutorial is what you would define an engaged user as. Sometimes your tutorials are extremely short and they take 30 seconds. That's not really an engaged user. So finding a data point in which you can say that this user is truly engaged and they feel like they've played the game and they've invested some time and really keying off of that data point. So it is really just about talking to your game designers and um, you know after that tracking the retention metrics that most people track, you know, day one retention, day 30 retention. Um, and then just going from there and, like um, you could build a retention funnel after that and you can really calculate your LTVs. Well, to, to come back on the post facts, right, I think uh, the, the key question is the usage. Um, my current issue is a lot of network, right, receive the post facts but don't actually act on it. So you still have to manually, you know, whitelist and blacklist the different publisher IDs for the network who share them. There are still a few networks who don't share their publisher IDs. Uh, and so the user acquisition team have to go through it and 
Um, often, I guess, when we, we try to instrument a little bit deeper, like level 10, 20, so it's like, you know, let's say 20 minutes, 30 minutes in the game, the problem is very quickly, you will uh, look at the list of publisher ID and realize that only a few of those publishers have enough installed to be even worth optimizing against. A lot of them, it's like if you get five or 10 installed, it's very hard to optimize against things for deeper in the funnel. So essentially, we tend to look uh, a lot at tutorial completion, your login completion, and probably you know five minutes, like three to five minutes into the game, just because otherwise it's you know you need to wait like two or three weeks before you can do a first round of optimization. Um, so I say the early signals in terms of postbacks are always very interesting for us to instrument. Oh, we'll we'll take questions at the end if you want to just jot it down. Um, so it sounds like you were definitely doing optimization, Fabian. Uh, the other two of you, can you talk about uh, if you're doing optimization, what's the process like as well? All three of you. You can share any secrets uh, of what are some of the uh, valuable aspects to optimize on some of the segmentations that you're currently using. Do you find valuable to optimize male versus female, age demographics, anything like that? So, our optimizations really just come down to social behavior. I mean, if anybody's played Game of War, that game is a social game. So, you know, just getting somebody through the tutorial and then trying to optimize on you know, do they join an alliance? What are the important things of your game? Some games don't actually care about social behavior. Some games just want to optimize on getting a player to return and play multiple sessions in a day. So I think really what matters is what what is the hook in your game and how are you going to get somebody to monetize after the game? So like I said, game war, social game, a game like Bejeweled even though or not the Joel Candy Crush, and those type of games, even though they call themselves kind of social games in a way, really they're optimizing on the replay value and getting someone to a gate, and then hitting that gate and spending after that gate. What, what's the specific feature in Game of War that you think, I, I just don't know it at all. What, what, what is the, sorry. You're clearly not the, the audience. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not the audience, but what is that, what, what are some of the defining features that you think make it much more socially driven? I don't know, it's, I would say our chat system is practically it. Like you can, I've seen people just talk about nothing on there. And it's, it's almost <laughs> like if you get somebody there, right, then, then the community kind of gets built around the player. Um, we have other social features that, you know, include like alliance ranking and people use those a lot. But communication features really is what helps a, a game like Game of War or anything like that. So you would so so some of the things you're looking at is is this person a chatty person? Yeah. Or <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like what kind, how, how do they communicate with other players? Mm -hmm. You know, and then they score all those different things and decide whether a player that went through tutorial A or tutorial B, you know, they could teach them how to do that, did it get them through the right flow? That's really what we optimize for. Uh, for summer games, you know, we have a variety of games. We have uh, IE pet games, we have casino, uh, casino games, we have uh, mastery games, right? So uh, just as Danny was talking about, it really depends on what type of game, right? So for slots games specifically, you know, you want to make sure that that individual is spinning a certain number of times, right? So they spin the reel uh, as soon as they get in. Uh, how do you optimize that experience? Uh, for a game like Dragon Story, which is kind of a... Uh, uh, undeterministic breeding of dragons. Uh, we tailor the experience so that you're ending your first experience breeding two different dragons and you don't know what you're going to get at the, at the other end. Right? So we're hoping that you get to that point and then you come back <coughs> to see what your, your prize is. So it really is about the design of the game and what, what you put in there um, hoping to get people to come back and play, play more often. Okay, uh, let's turn our focus away from uh, coming in and installs to actually monetizing the game. Um, beyond, well, let me ask the audience first. How many here are studios that are 12 or less? A few hands. Uh, what tools would you recommend, aside from the LTV attribution, uh, would you recommend for these smaller teams to use that have limited resources, limited headcount? On the game side or on the acquisition on side? On the acquisition side. <laughs> Is that not your... No, I'm just going that up to them. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. 
<laughs> you know, I always say what, what's key is, let's say, if you have only one marketing person, right, in your entire studio, is uh, finding out uh, other people that could help him or her is one thing, right? Like the, um, leveraging the analytics team uh, that's usually really focused on the product and you know, having uh, one of your team members help uh, your user acquisition lead might be um, you know, key. But overall, in terms of tools, um, you know, one of the, some of the tools that least have used in the past uh, is, you know, as we say right now, all those tracking partners, none of them is actually having the cost. Uh, some of them are working on it, but you know, they always say, oh, I'm working on it, and then it comes one year later, and you're like, oh, okay, uh, that's it. So in the meantime, you have this big problem often that uh, you know, your user acquisition team has really good uh, install attribution, but they don't know how to link the cost and the revenue. Um, so there is a few tools uh, out there. I think the first one, um, so I'm at Avali, so full disclosure, uh, but we, we do have a dashboard that allow you to re take all the costs from the different networks as well as the ad revenue, and that's a free product. Uh, and if you're ready to spend a little bit of money, I and mean, if you have a small team, there is a, a really solid product named Singular, uh, paid product, but again, that take all the data from the different ad network, um, and I've done all this API integration job, and then take the revenue data from the tracker, and so you have an all-in-one dashboard, as well as uh, some um, revision on the creative side as well. So I will say, you know, you could start with Avani uh, or advertising product, and then, you know, if you have more budget, and once you start to spend bigger user acquisition, eventually look into Singular as, as a good tool to help uh, keeping your uh, user acquisition head cost to uh, to one person. Anyone else want to add? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I've, I've only yeah, I've only to big data. Okay. Uh, players, there was a bit of debate earlier in the first talk. I'm oh, sorry. Take questions from audience, maybe after this. One. Okay. Yeah. Uh, players can add value to a game aside from actually spending. They can add financial value through eyeballs on ads. They can be viral and invite a user who may spend in the game. Uh, how do you measure these other forms of value from users aside from actually spending money in a game? How do you add, calculate that value? That's actually a lot of work. <laughs> that, That's why I yeah, asked. Yeah. We don't do the work, we just assume it exists. Yeah, you <laughs> so um, that actually takes a lot of work and a lot of no understanding about your own game. Um, you know, like we understand that there is a lot of social value to people that chat and people that run alliances, right? So we, when you track a user, track whoever you're tracking, you know, we, we assign values to different people and there's been a lot of work at Machine Zone just on figuring out the value of a social user. Um, for, like, like I said, for a game, let's say Candy Crush, it might not be as valuable. So. Um, I guess what I would say is it's really, really hard because you have to take your monetization value and somehow attribute it to people that don't actually spend money. Um, it's in Game of War, there are people that add extreme amounts of value to the game because they, they, help, they help the monetizing users get to a point where they will monetize. Um, there is value even in players that attack your monetizing users or somehow challenge your, your monetizing users. So it, that is really just a game design feature and you have to understand how that leads to monetization. So if you can get one of your analysts or you yourself kind of follow the stream back from revenue, back all the way back to that social user or back to those users that actually don't do anything, then you can assign the value, but it's, it's really, really hard. I thought you put a pretty good uh, equation right here. <laughs> What's that? Just uh, you, you add what you have for advertising, what you add for uh, LTV, and you go backwards. Uh, but yeah, as, as Danny said, like a lot of the community around a certain game, especially a game of war or um, you know, action, an action strategy game, whatnot, uh, you need individuals who will attack your high level players. You need individuals uh, who perhaps need to get farmed and whatnot <laughs> to keep others engaged. So you definitely need to build that uh, community. And it's, 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 it's pretty difficult to figure out uh, exactly what the monetization attribution is. But you know when you lose those whales who have no one else to farm, who have no one else to fight against, 
uh, then, then you're really hurting. <laughs> so you definitely need to keep uh, the community uh, pretty vibrant. Do you, uh, I have a question. Do you, uh, at, at say Storm 8, do you, before launch of the game, um, plan out like these are sort of the community driving metrics that we're going to be tracking at, at various points? And if this all proves we've got to have like a task force fixing things, yeah? Yeah, I mean, so we, you know, launch is a very special occasion. It's right? <laughs> it's all it's all hands, right? So every every single department is monitoring um, activity. You know, be it the install source, uh, be it the tutorial funnel, be it uh, how the community is reacting mm -hmm. as the launch is going on and their feedback. So you know, we, we take everything into consideration, and if there are issues to the triage, then we, then we do that. Mm -hmm. If not, then which usually. <laughs> There are things to, to fix. Yeah. So I'm going to open it up to the audience, but I want to ask one very quick question. That hopefully, you can address uh, best practices around pricing uh, in the in-game store. If a developer wants to maximize the spend, how many price points are ideal in that store? Very quickly, do you have an answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, just on on core games, right? Which is more my experience. I think we've tested like four, five, and six price points, uh, and uh, after a bunch of testing, we figured out that for core gamers, having six price points, two for the first time players, so generally speaking, you know, uh, quite low, like uh, two ninety nine and four ninety nine. We're talking about core games. Two more for the dolphin repeat buyers, uh, so generally speaking, for ten bucks and twenty dollars, and then we have two for the whales. Um, but it's not so much having six price price points. What was really interesting was really about building an upsell every time between nine ninety nine and nineteen ninety nine, and really showing in terms of premium currency a lot more currency for the second scenario. So if somebody is coming back, have an intent to purchase, uh, we we saw a big uptick in revenue when we were able to show them that it was really important for them to go to twenty dollars instead of ten or ninety nine dollars instead of fifty dollars. Um, so six uh, price points and a big upsell um, each time. Uh, each level. So Fabian was not fast, but it was a valuable answer. You guys have that before we open up the questions. Starts. I would just like to it's say a very that. tough question. Yeah. Yeah. It is, but why, why do you want them to do it fast? Well, yeah. maybe take your time. <laughs> so I completely agree. Upsell, upsell, upsell. That's the, the amount of price points don't necessarily matter too much. You don't want to have too many. You, you want to give someone an in-and-out menu, not the 4,000 you know, point menu. But the upsell is extremely important. You, you do gain a lot of value out of showing that 499 player a $20 upsell. Okay. Uh, I mean, we're, we're actually having this conversation now. Like, the upsell in general, I think is, I mean, I guess it depends on your game. But, you know, I'm seeing some players do repeat purchases of like hundreds, right, per month, right? So then the question came up, well, if you upsell them, you know, it's essentially giving a volume discount. So you're giving them 20% more currency, you know, for the same price and things like that. But if they were already going to repeat purchase, then maybe we should try to, you know, keep them at with where they're at and just make sure they're not, you know, going to drop off in terms of uh, their buying behavior. Like if it's a one-time game, right? So if it's, it's a finite game, then on that last purchase, definitely want to upsell, right? Because they're, they're not going to come back, so, you know, you, you, your wall can be as large as, as they like. So a bit of debate on the panel. You had a question here? Yeah, two quick questions. One is, um, how many A-B tests and variations of those A-B tests do you generally see in your games? Second question, for those of you who calculate LTV, uh, looking back at, like, the uh, LTV you calculated after week one, what's your accuracy on those calculations? So Mac said in her presentation earlier that predicting LTV at a very early stage in the game uh, can be considerably off. Uh, so that's kind of what this question is relating to. How accurate have your LTV projections been for very early install users? And then secondly, I guess it's how many A-B tests are you doing? Which, uh, so I actually don't like LTV. I think LTV is a bad metric. It, a lifetime value of a user lifetime is when 60 days. 120 days, is it three years from now? If your LTV is $1,000 in three years, how fast did you get there? Did you get there to 500 in one year? Did you get there to 500 after two and a half years? So I think the more important metric for any game developer to really go for is how fast am I making the money back for the user I just bought? 
right? And if you can speed that up, it doesn't matter how much your LTV is really worth, right? The faster you can pay for any user, it should, should be the real metric you're looking for. Interesting. Interesting. You tell me anything? Huh? No, just uh, the experiments. I, I personally don't like to do two, more than two or three experiments uh, on a game uh, in general. But then even you can do more, but you just have to watch where those pinch points are. So if it's like a tutorial, you know, who exactly is experiencing those experiments? So if it's tutorial, like brand new users, and maybe you can do one there, and then maybe one for higher level users. But if you have, you know, conflicting uh, experiments that are affecting the same cohort of users, then you're going to have dirty data. So you just want to be careful about that. Uh, there was one way in the back. I'll come to yours. Yeah, so this goes back to the uh, social aspect of the game. <coughs> We have an amazing CS department, um, so you know if we find any unruly players, you know if they need to, they get banned. If they need to, they get it. It's just so a big band hammer. Well, the community is super important. I mean, it just comes down to the community is extremely important. The community is what makes Game of War work. So protecting that community at all costs is it's just it. Like our CS department is on it all the time. Like, the number of tickets that they do is just amazing. And they're always watching the game, they're always playing the game, they're always chatting in the game, they, they keep track of everything. So protecting your social network within your game if your social game should be almost number one. Uh, or you have a question. Yeah, um, so you've got a game and you've got a bunch of metrics retention, uh, tutorial completion, CPI, um, I don't know, the arc out. Are there any of those that you feel like uh, are impossible to move or any limits on any of those that you would say, look, you got to 50% retention and don't bother anymore, you're not gonna move that anymore? Limitations on the acronym SOUP. <laughs> well, uh, I think time, you know, the average time a person is, is dedicating to a game is, uh, in general, if, if your game starts and people are just spending like a couple of minutes a day on average, uh, it's really, really hard to fix that. Uh, that means, you know, both the core loop and extended loop isn't very strong. Um, so generally speaking, I've seen, but if you're above 30 minutes, you know, then you could add some live events and go to 35, 40, 45 minutes and, you know, climb all the way up to one hour. Uh, but I think it, every time I've seen a game starting with like less than 10 minutes, it, it has been really hard for the game. Well, I've never seen the game recover from that. So I will say time is probably the one metric to watch. Uh, there was a question from Ian, and then I'll come to the front. <laughs> um, I'll go back to my original question. I had a follow-up to the social, but I'll ask you later. Um, I wonder if you guys are playing around with whale maintenance, um, whale tickling. <laughs> uh, if you're if you're watching the activity of your better paying customers, and if the, um, for instance, you mentioned getting attacked or some of the engagement stuff, those numbers start to drop off. Do you play around with kind of seeding the activity for that player to keep them engaged? Uh, I, I think. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good question. So I've seen twice, you know, programs from the consumer support team about, you know, precisely engaging the whales, having VIP programs. Every time, for some reason, they were not carried through. Um, I think um, some of the survey we did is the whales could find creepy to actually have, you know, one-on-one -on -one communication and people calling them by their names and so on. Um, so that, that was one issue, I think, that emerged in, in both cases when the consumer um, support team engage some of those wells to ask them if they were interested. Um, and overall, on the other end, a re-engagement campaign targeted to wells and saying there is a huge you know, incentive. Um, so if you, if you try to do a re-engagement and you give them a few dollars of reward if they come back into the game, most of the wells don't, we haven't seen great re-engagement. On the other end, if we say, hey, there is like $50 of reward coming uh, for you, for free, come back in, please. Uh, it has been really effective on, on those wells. That's uh, the biggest strategy. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a 
my question. My question is, how do you normalize the price of a certain purchase? For, for example, um, standardize it across different countries. Um, the typical price for a lunch meal in the United States is different than the typical typical price for a lunch meal in China. But for some games such as League of Legends, they make it a champion skin price standardized across the the world. What that means is for somebody from uh, Central Europe where they do not make a lot of money, uh, they are begging people on the internet after Pax Prime for free champion code because it's like a, worth $100 to them while it's worth about $20 for me here. Um, so how do you optimize your price point in different countries in your game so the, hopefully what it costs me a normal lunch in San Francisco is what it costs somebody in the Philippines is also their lunch money, not, your, not their whole day's wage. Uh. Well, you know, probably if you make as much money as Game of War, but uh, <laughs> you don't have an interest in doing that. Uh, in my past experience, even when we were making a lot of money with Rage of Mohammed or Blood Brothers, we didn't do that. So in short, you know, it was one price point for everybody, and users in Europe were seeing like very weird price in euros, because we tend to think in dollars and that's it. Um, so I think there is probably an upside there, but not a lot of developers are spending a lot of time to normalize, uh, especially because they think about the Western world or you know big Asian territories where I guess the price gap isn't as big. They don't think so much about developing countries. Well, I think we've run out of time. This has been really good content. Uh, feel free to come up and uh, chat these guys' ears off after real. Thanks. Uh, two quick announcements. announcements. Yeah. So um, uh, you guys were voting on whether Yetis are big drunkards or you just love them with your tickets. Anyone yeah. notice that when you sign up for the event? So the, yes, the conclusion is you love us. We don't drink that much. Very sweet. Now, had you chosen we drink a lot, we would have given you all shot glasses. But, you know, hey. Uh, I was drunk when I answered the question. So. Yeah, see, but you don't count. <laughs> so uh, October 7th is our next event. Uh, just between this room, we actually have Brian Sapp from Warner Brothers as one of the panelists then, as well as Paul Finn from InMobi and a number of really cool folks, so. And Justin from uh, and Justin Double Bailey Fine from Studios. Double Fine uh, Studios. And the topic's gonna be Gorilla versus Engagement Marketing. So very interesting one, save the date, and we're gonna be sending out announcements soon. Thanks everyone, take care, good night.